Hi, this is Mike at Brash Monkey, and uh, here's the latest build of Spryder, and I'm going to be showing you a quick overview of all of the current features that have been implemented and give you a general guide for workflow using Spryder. So first, let's cover the basic concept of Spryder. Spryder is not used to create images. What you do with Spryder is take pre-created images and move them around to create animations. So the first step is to create images that you'll be using to create your fully assembled keyframes. And you can see here on my desktop, I have a folder called Spryder Demo. So you're going to create a project folder that will contain subfolders, if you would like, with all of your images that you'll be needing to create and animate your characters. The next thing you'll need to do is boot up Spryder and choose File, New Project, click OK, and then direct Spryder to the uh, folder that you've created for your project, which in my case is called Spryder Demo. Now you're ready to begin, and you'll see over here you have your file palette, and if you click to extend these folders, you'll see that all of your images, which by the way should be PNG images, um, in that folder, and here are the other images in the other folder. Uh, and then here is where you're going to actually start creating and naming your animations. And collections of animations can be nicely organized into entities, which you can also rename. Uh, for instance, we call this guy Boss. And then we can call this first animation idle. So that's a nice way to stay organized. So here's your animation list. Here's where you're going to be grabbing your images from to create your, your characters or objects. And this area here is the canvas um, where you'll be building everything. Before I get started on actually assembling and animating a character, I wanted to mention one cool thing about Spryder is depending on what you're animating, you don't necessarily need to use bones at all. Uh, for example, if you're just animating a simple object that you want to move across the screen, you can literally just grab it and drag it right onto the canvas and get started. Uh, by default, you start on the, uh, the first keyframe uh, at the sort of zero timeline position, uh, and then you can simply drag um, to a new position and change its posi position, scale, rotation, and alpha. Um, but before I do that, because I'm going to rotate this star, I'm going to just hover my mouse over this top left corner where the default position of the anchor point is, and left click and drag, and I can put that in a new position. So I'm going to put it roughly in the center. Um, and so now when I go to a new position on my timeline, I just click and drag, and I've now created a new timeline that basically recorded the new position for that star. And so let's say I want to also make it get bigger. So I'm going to hold shift while I drag so that it maintains the same scale. And then I'm going to rotate the star. And you can see here in the objects property window, I can uh, change all of this stuff by typing or with these gadgets here, and I'm going to reduce its alpha. So now you can see, if I drag across the timeline, I've got this nice smooth animation going on with very little work. Um, I should mention, once your animation gets a little more complicated, two hotkeys that are extremely handy, the two key will advance you to the next keyframe, and the one key will bring you to the previous keyframe. You can also turn off some animations you don't want to loop back to the first frame, which was why it was bouncing back. So if you turn that off, now when I play, it's going to play forward and then go back to the beginning without looping. Another thing you can do very easily in Spryder is actually change at any point during an animation which image is being displayed by a given sprite. And without even even needing to create a bone first, uh, as soon as you drag any image onto the canvas in Spryder, 
it considers it not just an image but an entity which means at any point you can tell it to display a new image uh, within that entity so just as an example I'm going to drag anywhere on the timeline even if it's not a keyframe yet and if I make sure the star is selected and I can just go into the file palette and right click on any new image and you'll see it instantly changes here in the canvas to reflect that new image so we go back and you'll see now that once we hit that new keyframe it created it, it's still perfectly tweening the, uh, the movement and rotation but now we've got this uh, additional um, information to change the image of that sprite uh, and then when we get to this last um, keyframe you'll see it went back to the original start image because the image data for that uh, keyframe was already there as the previous image so if we want we can change that to an even more dissipated star image and you can see how that works so to demonstrate another aspect of this image swapping ability or another part of the user interface for that um, I added this explosion effect here which changes frames throughout the course of the animation and so not only can I go into the actual file palette to pick my images uh, there's something even easier I can do, especially now that there's already a set of images assigned to this to this sprite. Um, if I right click, it'll actually show me every image available in that particular folder uh, for the image. But I can also change the image source to just the images that have been used previously with that object. And now you see I can very easily uh, go back and forth and pick between the, uh, the images specific to this object. Um, another really cool thing about Spryder is um, any particular keyframe can have a totally uh, separate set or totally distinct set of objects or images or sprites. Uh, they don't have to correlate to each other at all. Obviously if you want something to tween then it needs to know it's the same object but uh, if you're doing, you can actually even do a combination of having some objects tweening and some, some objects uh, not tweening. And just as an example, I can arbitrarily take any one of these images at any keyframe and put it in that keyframe. And now if I pan through my animation, you'll see that that object does not exist if you look here in the Z order uh, part of the interface. Um, but as soon as I hit this keyframe, I now have that object as well, and that will remain there until we hit the next keyframe, whose data does not include that object. A minute ago, I briefly mentioned the Z order uh, window here, and obviously, you can tell by its name, you can use this to simply click and drag um, to change the Z order. If, for example, I want the star image to be above everything else, I simply click on it and drag it up there, and now you can see it's above everything. And uh, again, every keyframe can have the same objects or different objects, uh, and you can change their Z order at any point. And of course, you can drag to a non-keyframe area, change the Z order, and that will create a keyframe there, which simply swaps that Z order for you. Okay, so let's say now we have this really nice animation we've set up, but let's say we want the animation to take twice as long to play. If you look down here in the timeline area, um, there's this little properties uh, icon here. If you click on that, this uh, little dialog pops up. You can uh, change the name of the animation here as well, uh, or you can change the duration. As I said, I want to double it in this case and by default stretch key intervals to new animation length is already selected uh, and if I click OK you'll see down here now I can scroll through this because the length of animation has doubled and if I click play you'll see it plays at half the speed uh, and if you want to zoom in or out in your timeline so that the whole animation is on screen uh, you left click down here anywhere in your timeline and then hold control and use the middle mouse button and you'll zoom in or out on the whole timeline. 
And one thing you may have been uh, wondering about the timeline is uh, what about the keyframes for specific or individual objects? Well, for a lot of uh, types of animating, very often, or especially at the beginning when you're just setting up your animation, uh, this one main timeline might be all you need. So by default, that's what's showing to save you space on your screen. But all you have to do is click here and drag up, and you'll see that we have, um, uh, beneath the main timeline, we have the individual timelines for each object. And by moving the mouse uh, over the name of each object, it'll highlight that object. And here are some useful tips for navigating around your canvas. If your mouse has a middle button, you can just click and drag that to scroll it around. If you somehow get sort of lost by scrolling way out somewhere, you can always click these little green arrows up here to recenter everything. Uh, again, if you have a middle mouse wheel, uh, just rolling your wheel up and down will zoom in and out. Um, if you do not have a middle mouse button, there's the space bar. Uh, if you hold the space bar and then left click and drag, that will move around the canvas. And then if you hold control and press space bar, it'll zoom in. And if you hold control shift and, oh no, I'm sorry, control alt and space bar, it'll zoom out. Okay, so let's say I have an animation already started, but I want to add in another object. I can do that simply by picking the first image that I want the object to use and clicking and dragging it into the canvas at whatever part of the timeline I would like. And remember, Spriter lets you have a totally different set of objects and images per keyframe. Uh, they're completely independent of each other, um, or they can be. So, because I only added it to this first keyframe, you'll see it disappears uh, at the next keyframe. So one way to get that same object into this uh, second keyframe um, is, well, let me, let me show you this. If I drag the image again onto the canvas, you'll see, I'll put it somewhere unique, you'll see it's not tweening, okay? That's because you can put as many of these images all over the canvas as you want. And because you're dragging from the file palette, they're all totally unique objects from one another. Okay, so I'm going to delete these and show you the proper way to add the same instance of this object to the next keyframe. So you'll see here it is in the first one. It's called FB full three. Um, and when I go to the next keyframe, it's not there. Okay, but if I click on object palette what this is, and make sure show objects used in current uh, flames is, uh, frame is checked, and you'll see FB full 3 is there. So I can click and drag this image from the object palette, and because I grabbed it from there, this is not referring just to an image file. This is referring to that specific uh, instance of that object within the spider animation. So now you'll see that that object tweens from that frame to that frame. Now that this animation has quite a few keyframes, and before we get into assembling and animating the character, uh, here's one last cool feature. Uh, if you go into the timeline and right click and drag to the side of, to either side of the little arrow that shows you where in the timeline you are, you'll see these red and green gradients appear. And those are how you set the um, sort of forward and reverse onion skin. So now you can actually see uh, any of the keyframes that fit within that gradient. A few more useful tips, uh, especially when you're creating animations uh, with sprites directly and not with bones. Uh, you might notice if I grab an arbitrary image here and pull it out onto the canvas, by default, it's always going to um, its default anchor point is always going to be top left and we don't always want that so I'm going to delete this and if you double click on an image in the file palette you'll see this dialog comes up which lets you set your uh, 
default pivot point, and this is associated with that particular image file. So now, whenever I click and drag this image onto the frame, onto the canvas, you'll see it has its default pivot point set for you. So now that we know the basics for animating with uh, sprite images and not bones, it's time to move on to bones. So I'm going to start a new project. And I'm going to, again, point it to that folder, which is called Spider Demo. And that clears everything out. And let's get back to calling this guy Boss. And this idle, the first animation. And I'm just going to, I have to click on File Palette so I can see my, uh, my images. I'm going to grab all of the uh, images that make this character. I'm using the mouse button to zoom out. Middle mouse button, I should say. And I'm just going to quickly assemble this guy. And remember, if I need to change the Z order, I can just do that here. I'm sure I'll need to uh, as I assemble him. I'm back, and as you can see, I put together all of the necessary image to make the completed character. However, I've not yet finished uh, fixing the Z order of everything. Uh, just to show you, if I want more room with any of these windows, I can always drag them out of uh, their default position so I can uh, give them more room, uh, expand them as I need. Uh, and then again to change the C order, I can click and drag within the C order. Um, and one other really nice feature, if you want to find something very quickly in the Z order list, you can also drag over it over the canvas. And in this case, I'm looking for the shoulder, which definitely needs to be behind the head. So I'm going to move it down below the head. So that's looking better. Uh, now that I have him fully assembled, I'm probably going to need to adjust his position relative to this crosshair, which is represents sort of zero, zero coordinate. And I'm just going to left click and drag over everything, and then click and drag to put him in a more a useful position for a game engine. And finally we get to add some bones. And first I'm just going to click on this uh, Z order window and put it back uh, here where it belongs. There we go. And um, so all you have to do is go into the canvas, um, sort of put your mouse where you want to start your first bone, and in the case of a character you're probably going to want to start uh, somewhere like the pelvis or the torso. Um, and you just hold down the Alt key, and then you left click and drag, and that will create your first bone. Set it to whatever scale and angle you want. Uh, this works for me. I'm going to stop there. Now you can see that created my first bone, and it is currently selected. So if I just keep going, and I hold Alt down again, and click anywhere I want to. That's a nice thing. These bones do not have to be exactly end-to-end. -end. I can start the second bone anywhere on the canvas that I want to. Um, but in this case, because it's the neck coming from the torso, I do want it fairly close, and I set it to whatever scale and angle I want, something like this. Okay, and because this bone was selected when I created this bone, this bone is automatically a child to the first bone. And you'll see if I click and rotate this first bone, the second bone goes with it as you would expect. So now for the only tricky part to remember, and you'll see how quickly this goes, just make sure that the bone that you want the next bone to be a child to is selected when you're creating a bone. So I want the shoulder bones connected to the torso and not, not a child of the, the neck bone. So I make sure the torso bone is selected, I hold Alt, I click and drag, I keep Alt held down, I click and drag again, keep it held down, click and drag again, and now the entire sequence of bones for the uh, upper arm, forearm, and fist are all set, and now I click back to the torso again so that I can assign the other arm, and I just do the same thing. I keep Alt held down, click and drag, click and drag, click and drag, then I go back to the torso bone, make sure it's selected, click and drag, click and drag, same thing, go back to the torso, alt, click and drag, click 
click and drag. Now that's the entire skeleton and it is properly assigned. If you needed to, if you made an error, uh, there are two ways you can very easily fix that. One way is in the list and you'll see now it's called the hierarchy list. Uh, you'll see now all of the bones and if you click you'll select them. So to stay organized you might want to actually just double click and rename them to things like neck and torso. I'm not going to bother for now, but that would be the next logical step to stay really organized and to make it very quick and easy for you to select a bone from the list while you're animating. So now that the skeleton is made and everything is attached properly and rotates as you would expect and moves as you would expect, now I need to assign the actual images to the particular bones. And that is also extremely easy. All I have to do is click on a particular bone to select it and then hold down the B key, B for bone, and you'll see that everything, every sprite image turns translucent, but then when I click on any of them, the one that is now assigned becomes opaque. So you'll see if I let go of B, I'm no longer in the parenting mode, uh, and everything is its proper opacity. I hold down B again, and now the head is opaque because it is assigned to the currently selected bone. So I'm going to select the this arm bone and I'm going to hold B and I'm going to assign both the shoulder um, image and this forearm or I'm sorry upper arm image to that one bone so you can assign as many images as you want and they can be anywhere on the canvas and you can assign them to that particular bone okay so I'm going to do the same thing with the torso hold B click on the image forearm hold B click on the image click on the hand rotate and you can see now if I rotate the torso, everything goes with it. I fixed the Z order for all sprites of the character and double checked simply by rotating the limbs to make sure everything goes behind or in front of everything it should when I rotate the limbs to extreme positions. Now that that's done, I'm ready to animate and to do that, all I have to do is drag to a new part of the uh, new spot on the timeline and do any kind of uh, rotation or move of any of the bones to uh, set up that particular frame and of course I can also if I unclick lock sprites if I need to change a particular image in a sprite at any particular time I can just go in here and right click to change that image so now the arm moves and the hand starts to open you'll see the arm starts to go back that's because it's tweening back to the first frame because the loop is turned on so one thing that's been hinted at that I should cover in greater detail is the fact that not only can you animate by moving bones to move the sprites that are assigned, but you can also animate the sprites uh, independently even though they're all they're, uh, a child of a bone. Uh, this has already been demonstrated by changing the current image of a sprite regardless of whether or not it's a bone. But you can also do other things. For example, I can change the opacity of the bone which will change the opacity of any sprite that's assigned to the bone but I can also let's say multiple sprites were assigned to the same bone I can control each one's opacity independently by selecting the sprite itself. Another great thing to keep in mind is that the uh, position of each bone relative to the other bone uh, can also be changed at any time and is also tweened. So if, for example, we need to move an arm to an extreme position that causes a break between the images that are attached to the bones, we can always drag by the base of a bone to reposition the bone as well. So it's not only tweening the rotation of the bone, it's also tweening the position of the bone relative to the other bone. For instance, if I were to now rotate the main torso bone, everything stays exactly as it should relative to each other. And that's the gist of it. I'm sure I missed a couple of hotkeys, but uh, the list of the current hotkeys will be in the description below the video. Um, there are a couple of other small points I want to mention. You may have noticed when I set up this character in the first place, when I was just dragging the image up, images on to set up the... Uh, the character, I didn't bother setting um, the default uh, pivot points to the images, nor did I do so 
uh, in the canvas by clicking and dragging here. And the reason I didn't bother was because I was knew I was going to be assigning them with bones and only rotating them via the bones. However, in some circumstances, not usually with characters, but in some cases, you might want to also use the bones to scale images. And just as an example here, um, to do that, if you select a bone and hold control, the, um, this is rotation still, but now you see these other boxes here. This is for scaling this way, and this is for scaling this way. Um, so that can be really handy, especially when you're not animating characters, if you're doing effects or things like that, or stretchy characters, of course. Um, but um, you will notice strange things might happen if you scale certain limbs, depending on the way you designed the image to be facing. But also, it's going to be scaling based on the uh, offset of uh, the pivot point, which is top left, which is certainly not ideal. So if you move that, you can see it's behaving a little better and staying in its proper place. So just keep that in mind. If you're going to be um, scaling the sprite with a bone as well, you should do two things. You should uh, design the image or export the image from your art program, sort of facing or lined up directly facing to the right. Um, and uh, when you are setting up your initial character uh, before you assign the bones, uh, you should carefully set the pivot point of each image either this way with the default pivot point for that image or by clicking once you dragged it and put it in place by left clicking and dragging the anchor point to put it where it should go. That way when you do scale uh, it's going to stay in the right place relative to the bone. And that's everything for now. Like I said, I'm sure I've missed a few things, but we'll cover that uh, in the near future as soon as we can. Thanks a lot.